Jensen Falls. Um, Christopher Jensen is with us and from St. Louis, and he's going to be presenting the webinar. Um, before I get started, just a little bit of background. We had asked Chris to come out and audit uh, one of our facilities that was fairly typical of industrial minerals operations. And the, his report will be available to all IMA members. Some of you may already have it. Um, if not, in the next issue of our newsletter that comes out very shortly, there'll be a link to it there and it'll be permanently stored on our website, password protected. Um, and uh, before I forget, uh, keep in mind that that report was done for IMA and IMA members and shouldn't be distributed past, past that group of people. Um, so, and, uh, so Chris had did a very good job and the, the safety people that were with us during the audit were very pleased with the results. And uh, we asked Chris to do kind of a follow-up webinar um, just to further emphasize the, the issue of slip strips and falls, which all of you know are, can be uh, very damaging to the human body and very expensive for companies and uh, it's a very important topic. Um, you know, I learned a great deal when I was on uh, Chris's audit with him, things that I had never thought about before, and um, some very simple solutions to some problems I had, I'd never given consideration to before. So I think that the webinar will be very informative, and I encourage you to, to get a hold of his report from the audit as well and take a look at that um, at, a, at a later time and kind of go through it and compare it to your facility. Also, I would encourage you to, to hire Chris at your facility if, if you are having significant issues, and he would be more than happy, I think, to come out and, and help you out in that regard. Um, as I said, we're all very impressed. So um, on the webinar today, we're, we're, all of you are on mute, so you won't be able to ask questions verbally, but you can type your questions in, and please feel free to do so at any time. We'll see those questions, and we'll read them off to Chris. We'll either interrupt him or wait till the end and uh, get your questions answered. And um, also a copy of his PowerPoint and a recording synced to the PowerPoint of this presentation will be sent out to everybody that signed up afterwards. So you'll, you'll, you'll be receiving that uh, usually within 24 hours or so. Uh, from Chris Greising, who is also here with us, our Vice President of Government Relations. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Chris Jansen. Um, prior to founding Haynes Jansen and Associates, Mr. Jansen held safety management positions with several Fortune 500 companies, in addition to working with numerous firms as a consultant for the insurance industry. Among his duties, Mr. Jensen has developed, implemented, and managed safety programs at startup facilities, as well as across multiple facilities nationwide. He has audited extensively, recommending and designing improvements to many safety and risk management systems. He is an active voting member of the American Society for Testing and Materials F13 Committee on Pedestrian Walkway Safety and Footwear and the ANSI uh, A1264 Committee Safety for Workplace Surfaces. Mr. Jansen is a certified safety professional, a certified hazardous materials manager, and a certified tribe 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 bomb -atrist. I knew I was going to mess that word up, Chris, and thank you for putting it in your, your bio. <laughs> um, certified tribometrist in the use of the English Excel variable instance tribometer, which is what he used when he assessed um, the, the, the facility we were at and uh, found out that some of our miner minerals, when wet, are very slippery. He also serves as a member of the Board of Directors for the St. Louis Safety Council, a chapter of the National Safety Council. Mr. Jensen has been qualified as an expert in safety matters by numerous circuits of the federal and state courts. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time, Chris. 
Thanks, Daryl. Thanks for having me, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's it's a, a pleasure to come back and, and work with uh, your group again. Um, as Daryl kind of gave me the lead in, this is going to kind of go over and summarize the report, the, the audit and the report that I did after visiting one of your member facilities. Um, kind of a background in looking at doing this project, we looked at several periods of member injury data and from the periods that we looked at what we discovered was injuries classified as slip or fall of a person really contributed about 23 percent of the overall number of injuries to uh, the members of the group. Um, so in descending order when I went through and broke those down by type uh, the most common things that we discovered as far as those injuries were fall to a working or walking or working surface, fall onto or against, fall from a machine, vehicle or equipment, fall from ladders and fall downstairs. So all amongst the things that I see fairly typical fall events is, is how I would I would characterize them. So as a result, uh, the scope of what we came up for as a project uh, was to look at a mineral processing facility audit that facility, analyze and discuss the potential slip, trip, and fall hazards that we encountered. Another segment of the project was to look at standards relevant to potential slip, trip, and fall conditions observed, uh, discuss those, those standards and kind of let people know what they were, and eventually uh, a summary report was produced. So that in, in a nutshell, that's what we did. Um, Kind of lead off, and probably a lot of the safety people uh, who are on the line will recognize this as, as well. Charted ground is some some of the general, the basic safety engineering practices, or also known as the hierarchy of controls when dealing with hazards. So the first thing on the list, what we really want to do in, in dealing with the things we find, is to, if we can, eliminate potential hazards through design. That's our our highest and and best solution with these hazards, if we can't do that, if we can't eliminate it, we need to guard the hazard. Uh, if, if guarding's not feasible, we kind of go down the list in priority order, and if, if we can't do that, we want to look at warnings, instruction, signage uh, to alert people of that hazard. And at, at the very end, the, the least desirable, of course, with these types of hazards are to do training. Uh, in order to educate our personnel to avoid or otherwise deal with a potential hazard. And you probably also know that I, I left out a few here in the typical hierarchy of controls uh, regarding PPE and things like that, but that really didn't apply quite as much to the particular situations we were looking at. So some of the standards considered, and some of these are, are familiar, I'm sure, to some of you, and some of them may not be. Um, the first thing we looked at on the list here is the, the ANSI ALI, the American Ladder Institute uh, safety, for, safety Standard for Fixed Ladders. Uh, the next one was the ANSI ASSE Safety Requirements for walk place work, Walking and Working Surfaces, dealing with floor wall openings, roof openings, stairs, guardrail systems. A1264, the provision of slip resistance for walking and working surfaces. ASTM F1637, Standard Practice for Safe Walking Surfaces, the Standard Guide for Composing Walkway Service Investigation, Evaluation, and Incident Report Forms. Uh, this is something that probably most people aren't familiar with. It kind of gives a template for when you have these incidents to look at them, quantify them, uh, so, that, so they can be easily compared against each other. Uh, the, the next thing was the International Building Code. There are some applications of the basic building code that are out there. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, the MSHA Act or, or regulations. And one of the things we had some questions after the report came out initially, and I want to emphasize that although we considered the MSHA standards, that the goal of this task of, of this project was not to really look at things that would be considered citable or, or recordable. Uh, really the focus here was to look at accident and injury history and what could be done to prevent those things based on the conditions observed. So I, I think 
we steered away from that just because in different regions uh, there's different interpretations and some of these things may or may not be cited. I mean some of the basic ones under MSHA of course are, are 56.11001 safe access uh, which is providing a safe means of access to all working places. Um, 11003 construction and maintenance of ladders. Ladders should be a substantial construction, maintain a good condition. Uh, 16002 bins, hopper, silos, tanks, and surge piles uh, where people are required to move around or over the, those facilities. Suitable walkways or passageways should be provided. And of course, housekeeping. Uh, 20003. Uh, Workplaces, passageways, storerooms, service rooms shall be kept clean and orderly, and the floor of every workplace shall be maintained in a clean and so far as possible dry condition. So, uh, and lastly, barricades and warning signs, 20011. Uh, areas where health and safety hazards exist that are not immediately obvious to employees shall be barricaded, warning signs shall be posted at all approaches, et cetera. So, although I know those are out there, um, that wasn't really a focus of this. So jumping right into it, some of the things we observed, and we're going to go through some pictures here. And also, as we go through pictures, I'm going to talk about some, some particular citations to some of the consensus standards that I named off right at the beginning. So this is the first one, an exterior walkway. And what we have across the walkway here, hopefully this is clear to everybody, there's, there's sand of varying depths that, that came across the walkway. So the specific concern here is sand or gravel, debris on a walkway can present a slipping hazard uh, because the materials can also change the contour of the surface, making it uneven and unstable. And one of the things that where that draws back to one of those standards I talked about was the ASTM 1637 standard, which has a real simple statement in it, which is, which is pretty powerful. It says, walkways shall be stable, planar, flush, and even to the extent possible. It also goes on to state walkway surfaces shall be slip resistant under expected environmental use and conditions. Next picture. This is at the base of a hopper where the tractor trailer in the background can be loaded. The issue here, this is the primary concern, the material piled up in the walkways used by drivers between their vehicle and the fixed ladder. Uh, in this particular application, the driver needed to go up this fixed ladder to do what he needed to do. Uh, so again, the concern here is in a regular walkway where we know we're going to have people on a regular basis, we've got uh, surface conditions that are uneven, irregular, non-planar. So it goes back to the same ASTM 1637 uh, standard previously stated that was those walkways should be stable, planar, flush, and even to the extent that it's possible. This was relatively close to the area. Uh, so you've got a couple things going on here that are, that are of note. The change of elevation and the transition between the different types of walkway material. You've got a concrete surface that did have uh, some refined mineral on it moving over to that heavy ballast or rock area. Uh, also, the, the other comment uh, I had was the, the use of the warning cone there that's damaged. Uh, it's not really an effective warning if it's meant to be there to warn somebody of, of an issue. Uh, so again, you've got this walkway surface that's uneven, irregular, non-planar. This is a, a great diagram that illustrates kind of the human factors issue along with, with a tripping incident. And, and this is, goes on as the title to your typical tripping event. So, what generally happens, and the concern is, the person's lead foot encounters that object in the walkway, and whatever it is, it's of sufficient mass, number one, also has to be sufficient height, to stop that continued forward motion of the foot and leg. So the inertia of the moving body causes the center of gravity to move forward. The lead foot, and sometimes the trailing foot, gets hung up from forward motion once your center of gravity moves forward. At that point, you've pretty much lost it and are unable to recover from the fall. So this is just a, a graphic presentation of, of what can happen when some of these conditions are encountered. This is an interesting one. This was in a electrical room and it had a piece of conveyor belt that was used for 
a mat in front of some electrical switch gear. So exactly what the purpose of it was, not entirely sure. Uh, but there's a couple concerns here. Uh, first one, this is a, a tripping hazard. Um, so what's the purpose of the mat? What's, is, is this appropriate for the location? Is this the right function? Um, is this supposed to be for trapping or capturing contaminants? That's the typical use for a mat, unless it's an ergonomic mat that's thickly padded for people who are standing for long periods of time. Uh, also, the other issue with mats, will it slide? Is it securely fixed in place? So there's a number of issues with, with these mats, uh, and actually this is, it can't really even be correctly characterized as a mat. So the things that I saw in this were, uh, you know, once again, the walkway should be stable, flush, and planar. Um, and one thing that I see a lot of, uh, and this goes on further in the ASTM 1637 standard, where we've quantified essentially what a tripping hazard is. And that's, that statement is changes in levels up to a quarter of an inch can be vertical without edge treatment. Changes greater than a half an inch shall be beveled with a slope of, of no greater than one and two. So one uh, unit of rise for every two units of run. Uh, changes in a level greater than a half an inch shall be transitioned by means of a ramp or stairway that complies with applicable ac applicable, can't even say that today, applicable building codes. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more. There's some other examples of that that I want to talk about. Uh, also, as far as math specifically, that's addressed in the ANSI ASSE A1264.2, where we talk a lot about the installation of mats. And some of the things I mentioned earlier, mats need to be installed so they don't create tripping hazards. Uh, mats and runners that are not recessed should have that bevel or graduated edge or other appropriate treatment to help reduce the possibility of tripping on the mat edge. Uh, further on in, in 1264.2, uh, mat installation, they should be installed and maintained so not to move when in use. And further, uh, because this is a, a device that has some wear and tear, uh, A1264 goes on to state under a, a heading called inspection and maintenance, mats and runners shall be routinely inspected adequately maintained to identify and correct conditions such as buck, buckling, edge curling, and other defects. And of course, any damaged mats need to be promptly replaced. This depiction gives a little bit different um, view of a tripping hazard, and it talks about this transition. So the relationship with the tripping hazard projection and it's, it's relationship to the falling. If that edge is beveled, as on the left-hand side of this graphic, you have a much greater chance of overcoming this hazardous projection and going on with somewhat of a normal gait. You're certainly going to feel it if your toe hits it, but you've got a pretty good chance of not having this completely transpire into a trip and fall event. Whereas the other way, this is obviously going to catch your toe uh, and institute that trip and fall event. So basically the, the, the break point is here, and in general, these angles between 0 and 90 degrees with the obstruction are going to create a, a relatively more severe tripping hazard than are your angles 90 degrees and greater. So the lower probability of a fall is what we're after, and that's the theory and the reason why these standards talk about having beveled edges, both not just on mats, but on other walking and working surfaces. And we'll have a couple more good photographs to illustrate that as well. This one, uh, this is some large railroad ballast, and it's used as a walkway by employees adjacent to, to the tracks. There's also mobile equipment in this, in this area. So some of the ballast is large and it's loose, other of it's compacted and firm into the soil. So you've got a couple different things going on here. Certainly you've got something where you can see parts of it, the walkway's not 100% stable or flush, certainly not planar, uh, and also with some of this large ballast that's been compacted into the surface, you've certainly got some things that would qualify as a tripping hazard that we looked at in some of the prior photos that are not going to be a smooth transition as you're walking. 
I should also probably mention that uh, one of the things that goes along with this slide where we're talking about what's a hazardous projection and what can make a person trip, research is shown and it's, it's reflected in the standard we talked about where anything greater than a quarter of an inch needs to have some kind of a, a beveled transition. Research has shown that a normal gait, your feet or your, your footwear may only clear the walkway surface by as little as a quarter of an inch. So that's really the background on where that number comes from that's made it into the 1637 standard. So I want to make sure I mention that. As we we're moving on through the facility, this is another area of, of concern. And I've used the red arrows here to highlight um, this. This is a, a paved concrete area that has the, the rail equipment coming in and out of there. Uh, and these are pretty significant trip hazard. Um, definitely have changes in, of level uh, greater than a half of an inch here. Uh, and the other thing to consider also and looking at a lot of these, these hazards, probably a, a disclaimer or potential hazards. One thing I should mention is we looked at these areas in the daylight. It happened to be a bright sunny day, the day we were out there. And this shows there's uh, another piece of equipment or a person standing there. It does cast some shadows there. But in evaluating your facilities, certainly one of the main things to consider is what the ambient lighting is. Uh, these conditions can be quite a bit more severe in low light or, or no light conditions. Um, so lighting also plays into this substantially. This is, this is also, uh, and that illustrates my prior comment as well. This is inside the facility. Uh, we've got some shadows from equipment and from people standing there. And this is actually in a, in a processing or, or manufacturing area. This is actually one of the smaller elevation changes that we observed on the day in question. Uh, the change in the elevation across this area was measured several places. The results varied from about 3 eighths of an inch to a half an inch. Uh, so the non bevel transition can certainly be considered a trip hazard, trip hazard and it exceeds the, the ASTM standard that we talked about uh, dealing with changes in levels that are greater than a quarter of an inch uh, and up to and, and greater than half an inch. This is also a different spot in the processing facility. And I highlighted this here with the blue lines from left to right because it was a little hard to see. What I hypothesized this was, this was in an area with quite a bit of fixed equipment. And probably at one point, this was where a piece of process piping was removed or put in or an electrical conduit was run, that type of thing. So the area between the blue lines was backfilled and actually had a fair amount of uh, mineral, process mineral in it. But it had a pretty good depression as far as something that could cause a trip and fall event. So once again, this was during the daylight. Uh, depending on what the ambient light levels are at night, if this is a two shift or a three shift operation, this could be considerably harder to see than even what it is in this picture. When we measured this depression, it varied over its length. But it came up to about a maximum of, of five eighths of an inch. So once again, we've we've got this unanticipated change of level uh, where this depression is partially filled in, and it was about 12 inches wide, and I said varying depths up to about five five eighths of an inch. So what happens biomechanically when you have something like that? I would generally characterize a situation like that, a, a fall event resulting from that type of a condition, as, as a misstep. Uh, so what's happening here is the pedestrian is walking along. They've encountered a misstepping hazard, which is uh, represented in the former picture as well as in this graphic by the unexpected lower elevation. So the footfall, the, the forward foot falls on could be certainly be a level walking surface, but it's quite a bit lower than what's anticipated. So the body pitches forward in an uncontrolled manner, 
you may or may not be able to recover from this. Uh, once your center of gravity, your body moves forward of your center of gravity, it's almost impossible to recover. And generally, the fall event consists of the person landing on their knees or on their hip uh, is, is pretty typical. This is an area where this is a loading dock that we observed. And it has a built-up ramp that you can see. The left side of it is indicated by the arrow. So for ramps, ramps need to be quite gradual uh, in order not to be a, a tripping hazard. This is, was a little hard to quantify in the space we were in. But on the left-hand side, the slope increases pretty drastically. Uh, in the center of it, down in the middle, the increase is not near so drastic. Obviously, this is set up for a forklift to come in and out and load material both in and out. Um, but this is definitely a tripping hazard uh, from this perspective. Now, some of the th something that could be done to mitigate this, uh, given the environmental conditions, painting is would would be tough for it to stay visible just because of, of the mineral and the traffic in the area. So that's a little bit tougher to deal with. But once again, you've, you've got a pretty substantial change in elevation here. This is a classic. Uh, this is the, the spot of a former support uh, for a piece of equipment or something similar. Uh, and it has the, the bolts that were firmly affixed in the pavement or in the concrete are still existent after the, the piece of equipment or, or the supporting uh, structure is, is long gone. Uh, these extended, if I remember correctly, about 3 quarters of an inch. And these were pretty close to a well-used walkway. So uh, this is obviously a, a pretty significant trip hazard. This area is by a scale, uh, so, there, so there's a number of things going on here, the, the background uh, being the truck scale. And you've got the steel plate that's deflected downward and has some of the, the large ballast, rail ballast, or, or rocks there. And you've got the other steel plate bent upward. Um, this is an area where there's a variety of foot traffic throughout the day because of the existence of the scale right there, uh, so obvious slip, trip, and fall hazard there uh, for a number of things, actually three primary factors involved with this picture. This is a floor opening. This is a uh, stairway landing, and it is adjacent to a uh, structural support beam. There's a opening that is greater than two inches in any dimension, any dimensional fashion that you would want to measure this in. Uh, this is uh, an ANSI A1264.1 floor hole, floor opening. Uh, anything over two inches in any direction uh, where either a person can trip or objects can fall to the level below uh, can, is classified as, as a floor opening or hole and needs to be guarded. This is one that, that people may or may not have any familiarity with. Uh, the issue here is, is wheel stops, and this is a this is a basic wheel stop that's made from uh, a piece of pressure treated lumber, or this could actually be uh, actually an old railroad railroad tie that's been repurposed. Uh, something that that we found out through research over the years is these wheel stops are a creator of a significant amount of tripping and falling events. You will notice. Uh, today, as, you're, as you go home and go about your business, that many shopping centers, uh, Walmart, pick a commercial, a uh, large commercial facility, have done away with wheel stops. Uh, you, see, you don't see them very, you don't see them used very much anymore. Uh, if they're going to be used, they need to be designed um, to be not placed in pedestrian walkways or foreseeable pe pedestrian paths. Uh, they need to be in contrast with their surroundings. They can be hard to pick up. I've seen and investigated accidents where these are um, covered over or painted over with asphalt sealant. So they're the same 
color as the pavement that they're resting on. So, and once again, they may be relatively visible during the day, but if you've got 24-hour operations or people working second shift, these things can become nearly invisible if they're not in a contrasting color. So, ASTM 1637 talks a fair amount about wheel stops and how hazardous they can be. Uh, the other thing, some of these things are very long and extend quite a bit wider than what a typical vehicle uh, width is. So if they're going to be used, they should be less than six feet in length. Uh, that way they don't overhang into the foreseeable pedestrian pathways. Uh, they, and that way they should be placed also in the center of the parking stalls. And uh, so also need to be contrasting colors. Um, the best way to handle these things if you've got a concern about parking is to do a vertical bollard, a vertical uh, concrete post set in the ground. That allows a property owner to control where people park. They don't have vehicles overrunning onto areas where they shouldn't be, obstructing other pedestrian pathways, that type of thing. That's the, the, the highest and, and the most safe solution to deal with uh, parking depth uh, in parking lots. This is a photograph of a ladder, and I see this quite a bit. Ladders that are supplied that have no fall protection at the top of the ladder. Um, one thing I see fairly often is the chain at the top of the ladder. The chain certainly serves the purpose if your employees always put it back in place after they've ascended or descended the ladder. And putting that chain back in place when you're trying to descend the ladder obviously can cause some issues with where your hand should be when you're trying to use that ladder. So what I always talk to my customers about is forget the chain, go with the self-closing swing gate. They've become very common. They're readily available in the marketplace. You don't have to deal with the issue of employees remembering to put the chain back across the opening of the ladder, or likewise, because it's self-closing, they don't have to deal with it either on the way up the ladder or the way down when, when they really need to have three points of contact on the ladder, or preferably, if, if they can do it, have the fourth point of contact. And uh, the ladder, ladder openings, that's dealt with and discussed in ANSI A1264. Um, talking about the entranceway shall be guarded so a person can't walk directly into the opening. That's the big hazard there. Um, also, and I should also note here, uh, since this is uh, primarily a safety discussion, is that you know the, the tow boards here, the railings are removable. The tow boards aren't complete. I also wanted to, to point out that you know there's a little bit of, a, of another issue there, uh, although not directly related to to what we're talking about here at this point. Another ladder. Uh, we discovered this ladder. This is alongside of a silo. Uh, the area adjacent to this is where trucks can pass through this area for loading or, or, or unloading, as the case may be. The clearance between the ladder and the process piping when you hit the bottom of the ladder is minimal, uh, within, I'm going to say, 12 inches or less, depending on the point of the ladder that you're measuring from. Uh, the hazard here, obviously, is a tripping hazard. Uh, and the ladder standard in, in ANSI 14.3 talks about clearances on the climbing side of ladders. Uh, ladders without cages or wells need to have a minimum perpendicular distance clear of 30 inches from the center line of, of the steps and rungs to the nearest permanent object on the climbing side. So if you were coming down this ladder, and had accessed the platform above from one of the other ways it could be accessed and you came down this, you weren't familiar, uh, weren't paying attention uh, to that process piping there, this is certainly a, an easy place to, to get hung up on and, and have a fall event. This uh, speaks for itself, uh, damaged ladder. Uh, on, on descent, the key here, the safety concern here is on descent, missing that bottom rung. Uh, so steps and rungs of ladders with the minimum inside clear width of a, of a step surface for steps and rungs should be 16 inches. The width shall be uniform 
and the same length of climb. So obviously the key here is, is we're looking for uniformity in these ladders and the way they're maintained. Okay, this is the area where we did some slip resistance testing. And a little bit of background here. This is a outdoor ramp. I'll jump forward here. This is another view from the bottom of the ramp looking uh, towards the top of it. The issue here was in the past, uh, obviously this is exposed to environmental conditions. The roof overhead here was being added to help deal with uh, the environmental conditions. And the, the key the key environmental condition, the natural environmental condition, was rain uh, and this ramp becoming wet. Uh, when the ramp became wet, the process mineral, the kale, the kaolin on this ramp became very slippery. So I did a number of slip resistance tests on this ramp and determined that when it's wet and how it was treated, this, lamp, this ramp could be extremely slippery or dangerously slippery when wet. Um, in testing it where the mineral was not compacted, it didn't test too terribly bad. But the issue with this ramp is it's subject to both pedestrian and forklift traffic. So what that does is that changes the characteristics of what we're looking at. It compresses the mineral, ensures it's moistened all the way through, and the ramp surface underneath is a smooth concrete without really any discernible ridges or, or anything else or surface asperities that would penetrate up through the mineral in the water. So I got some very low readings when the mineral on this ramp was both dampened, wetted, and then smeared with a boot. We determined that that was a reasonable way to simulate both foot traffic as well as forklift traffic and understand the conditions that would be present with water and the traffic. Um, I tested out uh, in the range of slip resistance the generally accepted um, reading for being reasonably safe is, is a 0.5 using the instruments that are available to test slip resistance. Readings in the 0.1 range are sometimes found on ice and other very smooth lubricated surfaces. So I found a reading on that surface when it was smeared uh, and wetted to be in the range of what ice was. Um, certainly, as a pedestrian, if you're walking down this ramp in the afternoon, and it's raining, or in the evening, whenever you happen to be walking down this ramp, it's been well wetted, it's been traversed by a forklift a number of times to mix the mineral and the water, uh, it's going to create a condition that's as slippery, and the range is as slippery as ice, and that's not really going to be expected by a pedestrian. So what's, what's the answer to this conundrum of, of how to deal with this? Uh, number one, an engineering solution that was being put into place uh, was this cover over the ramp, which is, which is a great way to do it. This will help keep the ramp dry. Uh, another measure, certainly, uh, to consider is to separate pedestrian traffic, keep pedestrian traffic off of this ramp and put it on a designated walkway or steps to access that level to and from that level for employees that need to do that. So those are those are a couple of the key areas and those are all important things to consider. So as far as what type of consensus standard I can I can point you to to deal with these issues, uh, that would be ASTM sixteen thirty seven and and it simply states walkway surfaces shall be slip resistant under expected environmental conditions and use. So we've got expected environmental conditions certainly here with the situation which would be rain. Uh, the use is it's for fork traffic. Uh, we could probably, uh, ideally if we can design a way to eliminate the pedestrian traffic, I, I think that's probably the, the best way to go. Um, further, ASTM 1637 says exterior walkways shall be slip resistant. 
shall be maintained as to provide safe walking conditions. I think that goes without saying. Um, also, ANSI A 1264.2 talks about housekeeping. Uh, in general, housekeeping programs shall be implemented to maintain safe walking and working surfaces. Maintenance procedures. Uh, written procedures, if in place, shall specify cleaning and maintenance procedures, including immediate response, routine operations, remedial measures, and reporting requirements. Uh, and, and at the bottom of our hierarchy of controls, of course, warning and barricades. So ANSI A 1264.2 also mentions warning, warnings and barricades. A warning shall be provided when a slip or trip hazard has been identified until appropriate corrections can be made or the area barricaded, and, and also alternate routes. Um, when a slip and fall hazard covers an entire walkway, making it difficult to safely route personnel around a hazard, barricades shall be used to limit access. If appropriate, assign a person to detour pedestrians in, con in conjunction with appropriate use of warning signs until the barricade can be erected and or the hazard removed. This was an, a spot, and I see conditions like this on a pretty regular basis. Um, a door opening directly over the steps without a landing. Um, this is immediately upon exiting an electrical room. So there's a couple things going on here, and there's a lot of mineral, processed mineral material that is in the area. So, and this is an area also that could have environmental conditions where this could be wet from time to time. So couple things here. You've got a potential slip or trip on the kaolin, whether it's wet or whether it is kind of uh, dried out and, and crusty and, and lumpy, as it were. Um, the issue with coming out directly onto a step uh, is somewhat mitigated by you've got a visual cue with that railing there. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about visual cues as, as these slides progress as well. Um, some of the relevant standards here. Uh, this is uh, would be the ASTM 1637 standard again, and this is what's called the short flight of stairs. Um, well, actually, before we get into short flights of steps, which we'll also talk a little bit more about in the, in the slides coming up, uh, ideally doors should not open over stairs. There's no landing here, um, and this is this, cl this classifies as a short flight. A short flight of stairs is three or few risers. And they, need, they should be avoided whenever possible. Um, the issue with short flights is a lot of times they are visually difficult to pick up. Uh, if you're not looking for them, if there's no visual cue, such as a railing, such as delineated uh, nosings, stair nosings, you'll miss these. And the, these are a classic trip and fall hazard. And we'll look at a few more of these. Uh, this is another one. Um, that's a particularly hazardous when you've got a doorway opening again, uh, you've got a step that's below, and actually this doesn't really even qualify as a step. This is, uh, the door actually opens over, that's an unsecured piece of timber, so um, I, would, I would hypothesize that that is a cutoff from a former railroad tie uh, that's, that's being used as a step. Uh, so this is definitely a tripping hazard, both in the fact that there's no visual cue that when you open the door, this is there. Also, it's unsecured, um, so it, it qualifies as a short flight. There's just uh, a number of things uh, wrong with this particular situation. Something with stairways in general. Um, this stairway, although it's, it's very sturdy construction, uh, it lacks a, a handrail on the right side descending. Most people are right-handed, and the lack of that handrail on the right side can be a real issue. Uh, and that, that's mentioned in ANSI A 1264.1, uh, where stairways not exceeding 44 inches in width, having one side open, shall have at least one stair railing system on the open side. If feasible, Handrails should be installed on both sides of the stairs, and that's really where I'm coming from with that as far as the right side descending. This is a portable three-step ladder or, or a portable three-step stool. 
um, is missing its support foot on the left hand side so it makes this inherently unstable uh, and this ladder uh, was not like it was set out of the way this ladder was appeared to be in near constant use in a packaging operation at the facility uh, so that certainly heightens the chance of a potential fall more with stairs uh, these stairs are visibly inconsistent in their riser height, the tread depth, and the level. Uh, the arrow points to one spot where you can see from left to right uh, there's, a, there's a big discrepancy in level. Uh, and also there's an intermediate landing right behind that arrow. Uh, so that's, that's also a concern. The height of all of these risers varied, the tread depths varied. Uh, this next picture uh, you can see here it's indicated pretty well the substantial height difference between the first tread and the next tread so going up a little bit less of an issue but coming down pretty significant issue uh, because you've got a situation like the misstepping hazard that we talked about about early on in the presentation where the depth is what you would not expect after you've walked down a number of these stairs uh, that can throw your your center of gravity off uh, and lose your balance and results in a in a fall event. So requirements for fixed stairs are covered in ANSI A1264.1. Uh, talks about the uniformity of risers and treads. Riser height and tread depth need to be uniform throughout any flight of steps, uh, including any foundation structure used as one or more of the treads of the stairs. So that deals with that bottom spot. Stair landings. Landings need to be no less than the width of the stair and a minimum of 30 inches in length uh, measured in the direction of travel along the center line of the landing. And that, uh, that landing near the top in the prior picture in this picture um, had some issues as far as what the actual depth of it was. Um, this also plays into where you're talking about short flights, three or fewer stairs, you're not expecting a transition. Uh, those, are, those are all issues that occur with that. So when it gets into visual cues, I mentioned visual cues and the expectation as a pedestrian walking on different surfaces. These steps are all the same base drawing. Uh, so the top left here uh, is, is the base drawing for all of these other three depictions of steps. If you're a pedestrian walking down these steps, there can certainly be some issue as to where the step edges are. Uh, some of this uh, is, is very hard to pick up depending on if you've ever gone up and down the steps before, if you're carrying something. Uh, the ambient lighting conditions also play into this. So I wanted to put this in here just as an illustration of some of the different things that can be encountered with steps and then you start to mix in some of these other factors where tread heights are not uniform or riser heights are not uniform, tread depths are not uniform. Um, depending on the finish of these stairs, you, you can really have some visual issues. That goes on to this one. This was inside one of the office areas. Uh, this is considered, this two steps, this is characterized as a short flight, like I mentioned before. Um, the concerns with short flights, of course, are that visually you don't always pick up the fact that they're there. Uh, in this case, the hazard of the short flight is somewhat mitigated because you've got the treads are a different color than the surrounding floor. Now, if the treads were finished in the same type of vinyl composite tile as the rest of the floor and also the molding, the, the decorative base trim was not there on the wall, you can kind of get an idea for how these steps would disappear from view if you weren't familiar with them, you may not judge exactly where they start or where they end. There's a lot of things with these slip, trip, and fall hazards are, as pedestrians, we do not, unless there's some reason that our attention is drawn there, we generally don't walk looking at our feet. We walk looking in the direction of our objective of where we're going. So 
and, and this is a, an important distinction because many times, you know, over the years, particularly I know myself and, and all the safety people as well on the conference call, you've investigated many, many accidents and injuries and probably quite a few slip trips and falls. So in looking at, at the work of others, sometimes I see a lot of accident causation or the cause of an incident defined as employee was not paying attention. Certainly that that can play a part in that. But the one thing I want to en emphasize, and, and hopefully it's coming through in this presentation, is that there are a lot of other environmental factors that come into play and other human factors that come into play. That sometimes the true cause of these accidents and injuries goes beyond the simple statement of employee was not paying attention. While that may be a factor, consider some of these other environmental factors and, and some of the some of the situations that we're discussing today. Uh, the next one also involves stairs, uh, obviously an exterior stairway. Um, and this is actually, I'd characterize this as a series of short flights. Um, once again, you have a visual cue here of the steps, which is the railing. Railing's great. Uh, that gives you a vis visible cue that there are steps continuing on through the elevation change. Uh, it's, it's bright yellow. It's on the right on the right hand side descending. Uh, but the other issues that were a little harder to pick up in this picture, um, the stairs were visibly inconsistent in their riser height and their tread depth. So virtually every step throughout the run was different uh, in, in both riser height and tread depth. So that's difficult for a, a pedestrian to negotiate. And, and the consensus, consensus standard in play there that I draw back to would be uh, the passages regarding short flight stairs that are contained in uh, ASTM F1637. Um, and some of the things that, that are called out there is in situations where short flight stairs or single step transitions exist that can't be avoided, put in obvious visual cues to facilitate improved step identification. So some of those that I mentioned, handrails, delineated nosing edges, uh, tactile cues, warning signs, contrasting surface colors, you know, and, and, and something that was obviously not in place in the graphic illustration of these steps. Um, there's not enough contrast and surface colors for some of these elevation changes. And also accent lighting and appropriate lighting can certainly help uh, in these situations. Stair railings. Um, safety concern here uh, is having a handrail extension that's graspable before the first step is taken. So it also, of course, provides a, a visual cue that the steps are there, but uh, the lack of extensions can result in a misstep uh, turning into a fall down the flight of steps. So uh, st handrail extensions are covered in the International Building Code. and the statement regarding handle extensions is handrails shall return to a wall, a guard, or the walking surface shall be continuous to the handrail of an adjacent stair flight uh, where handrails are not continuous between flights. Uh, the handrail shall extend horizontally at least 12 inches beyond the top riser and continue to slope for the depth of one tread beyond the bottom riser. And mats. We had the one mat early on and, and we're going to return and talk about some mat issues. Um, this mat, uh, interior mat, is well worn. Uh, it's, it's got some signs and showing some permanent buckling. Uh, it's light, it was light enough to move easily on the floor and it's also had its corner folded over itself. Uh, the right side of the mat, as you can observe here, is missing a significant part of its edge, of its beveled edge, which as we discussed earlier, uh, the beveled edge is key in not having another trip hazard. So the, the, the key hazard here, this, the key safety concern is that this could become a tripping hazard. So uh, the key citations here as far as ASTM 1637, it's mats and runners, 
uh, need to be, have a safe transition from adjacent surfaces. She'll be fixed in place or provided with slip resistant backing. Um, ANSI A1264.2 also comments on mats. Um, the mats and runners shall be, or other appropriate methods, need to be at building entries and areas where it's foreseen that operations may encounter contaminants on floor surfaces that are not considered sufficiently slip resistant. So the material that this mat is catching is, uh, is our process mineral. Uh, if it becomes wet, it, we, we've established from the ramp that it can certainly be slippery. Uh, so we do want to collect this process mineral and, and not let it become wet and be on and tracked on the floor. Um, so generally, uh, the general design, uh, the mats designed for the removal of dust, dirt, and moisture from footwear bottoms at building entrances and other appropriate locations need to be used. Um, the mats and runners need to be installed and maintained so they won't move when they're in use. Uh, and they need to be installed so they don't, of course, create a tripping hazard. Uh, we can remove the contaminants, but if the mat itself becomes a, a tripping hazard, it certainly becomes counterproductive. Uh, and, and part of that that goes along with using mats, of course, is the inspection and maintenance. They need to be routinely inspected and adequately maintained uh, to identify and correct any conditions such as the buckling, edge curling, or other defects. Uh, when they are damaged, they need to be promptly replaced. This is a photograph uh, at the base of a set of stairs, and I did a double take on this. Uh, this is actually not a mat. This is actually a truck, a truck mud flap. Um, so uh, this is, it's hard to tell exactly what purpose this has served. Uh, it, it looks like a mat. I, I can't say it exactly acts it as a mat because it doesn't really have any um, abrasive surface or, or anything to really remove contaminant from the bottom of footwear. Um, it certainly lacks a beveled edge uh, to minimize the potential for trip and I'd, I'd say it's generally ineffective at removing the debris from footwear bottoms. This is a mat that is really inappropriate for this use. This is an exterior area and this mat uh, is a carpeted mat. This is really appropriate for inside of the building. So as it's utilized, it's not really going to be effective at removing moisture or any other contaminants from footwear uh, or to prevent it from being tracked inside. So it's really a, a, not a, a non appropriate use for this style of mat. This mat, uh, an external use, it has the uh, large holes in it to capture uh, contaminants, which is good. It's going to keep the contaminants out of facility. The downside of this, it goes back to the maintenance aspect that we mentioned previously. Um, it's it's full to the point where a majority of the mat cannot trap any more contaminants. Uh, so at, at this point, it's becoming relatively useless. Another item uh, that can be seen with steps many times is on carpeted steps. Uh, carpeted steps can certainly be challenging. This is in an office area. Um, ASTM 1637 has a piece on, on carpet. Uh, section 5.3, carpet shall be maintained so as not to create a pedestrian hazard. Carpet shall be firmly and secured and seams tightly maintained. Uh, shouldn't have loose or frayed edges, unsecured seams worn areas, holes, wrinkles, other hazards that can cause a trip occurrence. Um, and of course, any type of shag carpet you never want to use on stair treads, something you're probably not typically going to see uh, in an industrial environment. And probably the, the, the key thing is carpeting absolutely needs to be firmly secured onto the tread and particularly around the nosing. So th those are a, a composite of a number of the conditions, potential hazards that were observed on the day that I did the audit. And so as, as a result of that, we came up with some general recommendations regarding what was seen and, and what could be done moving forward in relation to, to trip, slip, trip, and fall hazards. So one of the key things that, that I would recommend is designating and maintaining pedestrian walkways throughout the facility. 
Certainly, you know, the nature of a lot of facilities makes it difficult or impossible to maintain the entire facility in optimum conditions for pedestrians. So with that in mind, you know, recommend that walkways be designated and, and maintained at a high level and that pedestrian traffic is concentrated in those walkways. That way you've got an element of control. You can control what goes on in a small area rather than the whole facility. Um, there's a great reference text uh, to talk, that has some sample walkway auditing checklists, and that's a book called Slip Trip Involved Prevention by uh, Steve DePilla. I'd recommend that for anyone who wants to delve deeper into this. Uh, that, that's a very handy uh, reference guide. Another thought that occurred to me and, and that I recommend is that you know I recognize that the companies uh, in the group are required to report and classify injuries per the MSHA requirements, no doubt about it. Um, but in order to delve in deeper and look at these causes of fall events, you know, I would say that a more detailed and standardized approach for data collections established. Uh, you know, there's a template that's already in existence uh, to assist if you wanted to develop this area, and that's in uh, F1694. And it's titled the Standard Guide for Composing Walkway Surface Investigation, Evaluation, and Incident Report Forms for Slips, Stumbles, Trips, and Falls. Uh, that's, that's a good document. Uh, and in the time I've been involved on, on both this ASTM committee as well as the ANSI committee, uh, these things, I can assure you, are, are updated over time. I've been involved in a number of updates with, with these standards. And, and each time, they, they get better and more useful. Another thing I'd suggest, uh, if it's not currently in place uh, from a safety perspective, is to look at a near-miss reporting process. Um, that includes slip trips and falls, certainly as, as some among other injury types in order to look at areas for uh, prevention and also to kind of drill down and, and look at some of the root causes. Um, at facility levels, I'd recommend that mapping be considered for injuries and near misses. Uh, this can help to identify potential problem areas for further analysis or establish a schedule for maintenance and inspections where it gets into things like ramps that may become contaminated. You've got um, matting to deal with, things like that, that that need some ongoing inspections and ongoing care. Um, and I guess to sum it all up, I, I would say, um, and I, I alluded to that earlier, is to, is to consider the overall conditions of the facility that you're looking at and, and how that relates to any potential injuries that have occurred. You know, certainly employee input, employee attention to some of the factors that are existent in the workplace is certainly important, but, but I challenge you to, to take a hard look and, and look a step beyond uh, to what the root causes are rather than, than some of the things that I'm not saying I have not seen this with your group, but just in general where I've seen accidents characterized as employees not paying attention. Um, and, and that's really what I what I like to emphasize out of that. So we um, appreciate your attention today, and, and I'd certainly uh, welcome any, any questions or, or comments that you have. Um, if something occurs to you after today, uh, certainly you can contact Daryl, and he can pass it on to me or contact me directly. Um, if you have a need, you know, I'd, I'd certainly be willing to talk with you, with any of you, about uh, ongoing projects to uh, explore some of these uh, type of safety issues in, in your facilities. So I'd, I'd like to thank you for, for your attention. Thanks, Chris. We, we really appreciate it. That was an excellent presentation. And I, we do have a couple questions. If anybody else would like to ask a question, please just go ahead and, and type it into the box at this time. Um, one question we have is whether or not you have any recommendations on footwear. Footwear, there's, there's certainly slip resistant uh, footwear that's out there. Um, I see the highest use of slip resistant footwear in the hospitality industry. Um, that's not to say that that's the only appropriate use for it, but I, I think in a lot of industrial situations, the focus, I think, is as it should be on foot protection uh, with, with rolling hazards and, and things that can injure the foot in that regard. 
um, as far as a specific, um, I guess, specific footwear, I've had good luck with dealing with uh, the, ven the local um, vendor here for high test. I know they've got some slip resistant um, safety shoes uh, and, and safety footwear. Um, beyond that, ho hopefully I answered that question. Okay, and uh, one one more question that I have is: is um, can you give some examples of the the types of injuries that are the most uh, costly and uh, severe? As far as slip trips and falls, um, you know, I I have been involved in investigating many slip trips and falls. Um, I've been involved in a number of of death cases uh, from falls from heights. Uh, certainly, those are, you know, costly not just in dollars, but from a human perspective, and the effect that has on the other workers in the workplace. Um, so I, I think the cost of those, not just on the dollar level, but on many levels, are very high. Um, but you know, I, and I have investigated very serious uh, slips and falls on the same level from unexpectedly slippery surfaces where there have been hips broken, um, both kneecaps have been shattered in some of these situations where uh, the, there's an unexpected uh, low spot, kind of like we talked about, a misstepping hazard. Um, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I, I guess I've seen it across the board where, you know, even, even a simple trip over a change in elevation can result in a, in a catastrophic and life-changing injury. Okay, and uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. Back in uh, my safety days, I had a very severe injury on just a ceramic tile floor that was uh, uh, very bad for the victim and was extremely costly for workers' comp. So um, this is a very important topic, and Chris, we don't have any more questions, but we really appreciate your time. Do you want to give out your email, or would you rather people contact me and I pass it on? Either way, um, I'm, I'm, at, um, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, my email is chris, C-H-R-I-S, at HaynesJansen.com. It's H-A-I-N-E-S-J-A-N-S-O-N.com, or if, uh, if all else fails, if you Google Chris Jansen safety, uh, I, will, I will pop up, uh, usually in a number of different ways. So yeah. Right. Okay. Well, we appreciate it. And again, we'll be sending out this presentation very soon. And uh, we'll also be sending out Chris's full report to the IMA membership. And if you need that sooner, just uh, uh, give me a, a call or an email. And uh, I do appreciate everybody's time and hope you have a good day. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye.